everyone, welcome to our lecture, continuing on the autonomic nervous system today. And um, so we're gonna talk about the sympathetic and parasympathetic system specifically, and um, what organs that they, um, they act on. I know we've, we went over some of their characteristics, but we wanna take a look at what um, other things we can learn about them in the crash course, because those are always good supplemental things to, to give us. Um, what I want to do first, though, is go um, back to our PowerPoint and look at this in our notes. You'll be happy to know that I am not, oh, come on. I'm not going to put specifically this information on the exam. Um, I'll just let, well, um, okay, here's in general. We, I will have some information on this. I changed my mind, but it's super general. Okay, because it's easy to remember. So if we take a look at, remember that we always need receptors. That's what signaling our target cells is all about. As long as you have the proper receptors, then you'll be able to respond to any of the signals that your body might happen to be sending, whether it's a nervous signal or an endocrine system signal, it doesn't, hormonal signal, it doesn't matter. Um, so any, um, any of the fibers that are going to release acetylcholine, okay, so we know they're parasympathetic pre and post ganglionic, and sympathetic pre are going to release acetylcholine. So that's colon and then works on it. Urge means work. And so um, cholinergic will be things that work on um, with acetylcholine. And um, so the receptors for acetylcholine for the parasympathetic are cholinergic, cholinergic fibers. Okay. And we're not going to worry about nicotinic and muscarinic. Um, you can learn about that in the nursing program or someplace else. But I do want you to know that cholinergic fibers are those that release acetylcholine and then the receptors for those are um, cholinergic receptors. Okay, so fibers are the ones that release and then the receptors are cholinergic receptors. Okay, then by the same token for the next, um, the choler or the adrenergic fibers. So adrenergic are those which release norepinephrine. So we don't call them epinergic. <laughs> Um, so this could be noradrenaline, so that's where we get adrenergic. And the only adrenergic fibers are sympathetic postganglionic, and then the receptors, oh, dang it, sorry. And then the receptors for that either come in an alpha form or a beta form, and just know that those are present. We will be talking about alpha and beta next semester when we talk about um, the effect of the sympathetic stimulation on various organs of the body, heart, and and cardiovascular system, respiratory system, digestive system. Um, so anyway, that's, so adrenergic, those fibers that release norepinephrine. So they're gonna be part of the sympathetic system. Okay, so now I think as we go into a discussion of the um, target organs of each system that we're gonna watch our videos. So we're gonna watch the um, sorry, oops, let me get rid of this, put this down here, put this right here, all right, um, so many things I have to go to, okay, now we're ready, all right. To quit smoking cold turkey, so Shantix can help you quit slow turkey a lot. When your smoke alarm goes off, before you even know what's going on, you start to feel it. So smoke alarms are loud for a good reason. Your heart starts to raise, your breathing picks up, you become sweaty all over your body. You are stressed. I'm not talking about the my iPhone just died kind of stress. I'm talking about the I'm afraid I might die kind of stress. Even though it's often seen as a dirty word, stress, like pain, isn't all bad. It's actually very useful if you're, you know, trying to get out of a burning building. Your sympathetic nervous system is the part of your nervous system that responds to stress, and it does its job exceedingly well by focusing on what your body needs to do right now. Like when you're facing a life or death ordeal, 
you don't need to be digesting that cashew cluster in your intestines or producing reproductive cells or fighting off an infection. That's all stuff you can deal with later when you're out of harm's way. So your sympathetic nervous system sweeps these suddenly trivial functions aside to blast all of your energy to your brain and heart and muscles to deal with the threat at hand. So this is where I tell you that you're lucky to have a sympathetic nervous system and that it keeps you alive and that you would probably die in X period of time if you didn't have one. All of which is true. But here's the thing. The problem is, nowadays our body's stress responses are triggered all the time, practically every day, even when we are not in mortal danger. I mean, worrying about paying your wireless bill or being late for an important meeting, those things are terrible, but will not kill you. But good luck explaining that to your nervous system. Because your physiological responses to non-immediate stresses are largely the same as when you're fighting for survival. So if stress is like ruining your life, that's why. And that's part of the reason you should get to know how it works. Because by learning about your sympathetic nervous system, you come to understand what are the key players in the physiology of stress. So this is very, very true. Um, I saw a little Reddit thread or something about um, how we all have um, run away from tiger juice inside of us because we used to have to run away from stressful things. And since we're not running away from tigers anymore, we've got all this pent up juice inside of us that causes us to run away from the fact that my, I just dropped my iPhone and I cracked my, I cracked my screen or something like that. And so because our sympathetic nervous system is just like, we want to do something. Um, we kind of overreact today to, to some of the, the apparent stressors that we have. And so we need to, um, like you said, understand them so that we can deal with them and, and make them not be the problems that they are, like meditation and how we can, we can feel better with that. So, um, so we'll talk more about that when we finish watching Sympathetic Nervous System. You may recall from our tour of the anatomy of your autonomic nervous system that in both your sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions, almost every signal has to cross two synapses. Each neuron travels from its root in the spinal cord to a ganglion where it synapses, and yes, that is a verb as well, with another nerve fiber. And that one, in turn, leads to an effector organ where it synapses again to create whatever response was signaled, like sending more blood to your skeletal muscles or making your heart pump faster. But you gotta wonder, or at least I gotta wonder, how did these neurons and effectors actually communicate with each other, and how do all of those signals result in the high-octane sensations that we know as stress? By and large, the stress response includes two kinds of chemicals, both of which I'm sure you've heard of. The first, of course, are neurotransmitters. These are made and released from neurons themselves, and like we talked about in our lesson about synapses, they are what neurons use to communicate with each other or their effector organs across a synapse. The other chemicals involved in stress are hormones, which are secreted by your glands Glands. There are at least 50 different hormones at work in your body right now, and they do everything from regulating your sleep cycles to making your body retain water so you're not dying of dehydration all over the place. I'm telling you all this now up front because hormones and neurotransmitters are 100% necessary for understanding how your sympathetic division ultimately works. But when you trace a single sympathetic signal from the initial stimulus to the final response, those chemicals can be kind of hard to keep track of. That's because the very same substance can have different effects, actually sometimes totally opposite effects depending on where it's received in your body. And to make things even more fun, even though neurotransmitters are part of your nervous system and hormones are products of your endocrine system, a compound can be considered either a neurotransmitter or a hormone, even though it hasn't changed one iota, depending on where it happens to be operating in your body. So all of this can make understanding your stress responses pretty confusing. You might even say, stressful. All right, we're going in. The smoke alarm wakes you up. You smell smoke. It is time to move muscles. Fast. Your brain sends action potentials down your spinal cord and preganglionic neuronal axons. Those signals flow all the way to their ganglia. When the signals reach the synapses inside the ganglia, the nerve fibers then release a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, known to its friends as ACH. If you haven't heard of acetylcholine yet, you're gonna wanna remember that name. In addition to working in sympathetic ganglia like this, it's also what the rest of your peripheral nervous system and lots of your central nervous system uses to communicate. So when it comes to nervous communication, ACH is really the coin of the realm, the premium currency. So that acetylcholine crosses the synapse and if there's enough of it, it can stimulate action potentials in several neurons on the other end in the postganglionic fibers. That's all it does, but it's important. It 
it's basically a signal booster. Those postganglionic neurons then carry the action potential to the effector organs, in this case, let's say, your leg muscles, which are gonna need an influx of blood if they're gonna hustle you out of that house. And at the end of that second postganglionic neuron, the fiber releases a different neurotransmitter. This one's called norepinephrine, and it is always norepinephrine that's released from postganglionic fibers in the sympathetic nervous system. It's what crosses that final synapse and creates a response in the effector, like opening up blood vessels that lead to the leg muscles. So the preganglionic fiber releases ACH and the postganglionic releases norepinephrine, Boom, congrats, your life is on its way to being saved. But your body has more than one mechanism for responding to things, especially things like a burning house. There's another alternative for getting the message out. I mentioned those hormones, remember? In addition to nerve fibers that lead to ganglia and then your effector, there's also a set leaving the spinal cord that goes directly to your adrenal glands. Like all preganglionic fibers, these release acetylcholine too. But here, the signal doesn't end up in another neuron that triggers blood vessels to open or whatever. Instead, it triggers your adrenal medulla to release a flood of epinephrine and norepinephrine hormones that rush through your bloodstream toward your heart and lungs and other organs. Now hold up, did you notice what I just said? Yeah, I said the adrenal glands release norepinephrine as a hormone. Whereas in that first scenario, I said that norepinephrine was a neurotransmitter that sent the final signal to control blood flow to the leg muscle. Now, how can I say both of those things? Because they're both true. Norepinephrine is both a neurotransmitter and a hormone, and which one it is depends on how it's being used. If it's being released from a neuron and traveling across a synapse, we refer to a messenger chemical, no matter what it is, as a neurotransmitter. If it's being secreted by a gland into the bloodstream for more widespread distribution, it's a hormone. Okay, that's a super important thing to remember because we will, between the rest of this semester and next semester, be talking about <coughs> how hormones and, and neurotransmitters work together. And so remember, it doesn't matter what the nature of the chemical is because it's exactly, norepinephrine is the exact same structure, whether it's a neurotransmitter or it's a hormone, it just depends on how it's released. So it's released from a neuron, goes across the synapse, neurotransmitter, totally makes sense. If it's gonna come out of a gland, be secreted from a gland and go directly into the bloodstream so that it can be, like it says, widely distributed, then it's gonna be a hormone. Regardless of the name of the chemical, neurotransmitter, hormone. Even if it's the same chemical. And to an effector, hormonal norepinephrine is just as good as neurotransmitter norepinephrine. But as scientists, we describe them differently because they're functioning differently. Now, the ways in which a neurotransmitter slash hormone like norepinephrine works is a good example of another confusing aspect of your sympathetic nervous system because it works by both stimulating and inhibiting the same systems in your body at the same time. So, in our house burning scenario, the norepinephrine your system releases causes an increase of blood flow in some parts of your body, like your leg muscles, while restricting blood flow in other places where it's not urgently needed, like your guts. How can the same chemical cause opposite responses? Well, it all depends on the particular kind of receptors that an effector has for receiving that chemical. In the case of norepinephrine, its effector is smooth muscle, the muscle that controls all of your involuntary functions of hollow organs like the stomach and bladder, and also your blood vessels. On the smooth muscle cells controlling some blood vessels, there are receptors called alpha receptors. When norepinephrine or epinephrine bind to those receptors, they make those smooth muscle cells contract, thereby restricting restricting blood flow. But on smooth muscle cells that control other blood vessels, there are lots of beta receptors for epinephrine and norepinephrine, and when they are activated, they make the muscles relax, letting more blood flow through. So it makes sense that the smooth muscle around your blood vessels, which feed your skeletal muscles, which you'll need to get out of that smoky house, are covered in beta receptors, because you want those blood vessels to relax and provide plenty of oxygen to the muscles in your arms and legs. And since running away is more important than digesting your dinner, the blood vessels leading to your stomach and intestines have lots of alpha receptors, which reduce blood flow to those areas because that burrito can wait until you're out of the house. So there's a lot going on in your sympathetic responses, and much of it can seem complicated or even contradictory. But the thing is, all of these functions work together to create a full body response, which is exactly what you need in an emergency. After all, it wouldn't do you much good to speed up your heart without sending that blood to your muscles where it's needed. It's up to those neurotransmitters and hormones and the receptors on the corresponding effectors to make sure that everyone is on the same page. So the system works well, really well, 
sometimes too well. Remember when I said at the beginning how your body doesn't know life-threatening stress from life-annoying stress? Since your body's reaction tends to be a full-body response either way, it can become pretty taxing over time. I mean, we're talking about throwing parts of your body into overdrive while depriving others of blood and oxygen. That's not something you want happening every morning. So the irony here, the real kick in the head, it's that non-life-threatening stressors can actually end up endangering your life in the long run because your body's stress response is so effective. The frequent activation of your sympathetic nervous system and the triggering of the other part of your stress response, the part that's driven by hormones, can have nasty consequences like high blood pressure, digestive problems, and even the suppression of your immune system. So what your body needs to do is figure out how to relax, rest and digest, feed and breed. That is where your sympathetic system's more mellow half-brother, the parasympathetic system, comes in. And yeah, that's what we're going to be talking about next time. For now, you learn that your sympathetic nervous system... All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and, because we're going to go to the parasympathetic next, but let's take a look at... Oh, first of all, I just want to tell you <laughs> something. Um, that man with the baboons that just showed up on the screen there. Um, that's a, a researcher by the name, I think it was a psychiatrist, psychologist, something like that. Anyway, um, Robert Sapolsky, and he spent his life taking a look, his major research, I mean, he's still alive, but his major research was taking a look at the stress response in baboons so that he could translate, you know, take that into humans and, and see what kinds of physiological responses happen during stress. And um, so that's why they had the little shout out there to the, to the man with the baboons. So in case you're wondering, why is that there? Okay, so I want to go quickly to, well, actually, let's, um, where is, okay. Um, yes, we want to do this. So I, I skipped over this and um, we're gonna come back to this too after we watch the, the parasympathetic video. But what I wanna talk to you about now and, and, and like Hank was saying is that, that we've got sympathetic going on in our body but then we have parasympathetic that's gonna counteract that. And so this, all the organs in our body are essentially innervated by both systems, both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. So we're gonna look at the sympathetic first. So notice the same visceral organs are served by both divisions to counterbalance each other's activities and to maintain homeostasis. So if we take a look at this graph or this, this table picture, I don't know what it is. Um, you can see on this, on the right is sympathetic stimulation. And um, you can see that um, which things are stimulatory, which things are inhibitory. So this, the dotted lines are all inhibitory. Um, uh, stimuli, well, they shouldn't be inhibitory because some of them are stimulatory. So, oh no, I know. This is, the solid ones are myelinated and the, un, and the dotted ones are the unmyelinated ones because we have a myelinated one that goes right out to the adrenal gland. So. That's what that means. Okay, I had to think for a minute. All right, so if we take a look at um, places in our body that uh, sympathetic stimulation is going to go to, and then in just a moment, we'll take a look at, well, what are the effects when they go there? So we can see they go to the eye, salivary glands, lungs, heart, stomach, pancreas, liver and gallbladder, adrenal gland, bladder and genitals. And so in just a second, we'll look at, well, what do they do when they get there? Well, if we go over here to the other side, to the parasympathetic, here are the neurons that are coming. Oh, and remember, these are going to come out of the thoracolumbar region of the spinal cord. And then here, the parasympathetic are going to come out of the craniosacral region of the spinal cord. So the brain stem, and then down here in the sacral region of the spinal cord. So again, eye, salivary gland, heart, lung, stomach, pancreas, liver, and gallbladder, bladder, and um, genitals. Uh, now, wait a minute. Is there anything that's different on this side than on this side? Yeah, there is. Right here, the adrenal gland. And there are a couple of other places that are only innervated by sympathetic stimulation that are not innervated by parasympathetic. And, and we'll do those later on. Um, so yeah, the adrenal gland is only stimulated by sympathetic stimulation. There's no counteracting it by parasympathetic. So what does that mean? that if you want your adrenal gland to secrete its products, specifically the adrenal medulla, where we get epinephrine and norepinephrine, 
you send a signal to tell it to release epinephrine, epinephrine and norepinephrine. And if you don't send a signal, then it doesn't release. We just don't have, we don't have to tell it stop releasing. We just don't tell it to release and, and it won't. Okay, so let's go to, um, all right, so this chart goes through the effects of each system as well as this table. Same with this table. Um, let's see, so I'm thinking, uh, okay, let's just do the sympathetic effects first and then we'll counteract them with the parasympathetic after we watch the parasympathetic video. Okay, so we're going to start with the eye, the iris of the eye. So the iris of the eye is the part of the eye, remember, that we've looked at in lab is the colored portion of the eye and its job is to control the diameter of the pupil, to regulate the amount of light that's going to enter the eye. So I want you, as we go through these things, I want you to think of what would I need those organs to do if I'm running away from a Rottweiler? Because that's always my example. You're, you're sitting in your desk and in comes the Rottweiler. What do I need to do to save myself? Okay, so I've kicked in the sympathetic stimulation. So think about what do you want your pupil to do? Do you want it to get smaller? Do you want it to get bigger if you're running away from the Rottweiler? Well, here's what happens. It's going to stimulate the dilator muscles in order to dilate the pupil. Well, why would I want a bigger pupil? Uh, the bigger the pupil, the more light can be collected. And so as I'm running away from the Rottweiler, I can find my exit routes. I can find my escape places the, where I can be safe. And I can see that I'm not going to trip over that tree stump or something like that. And so by dilating my pupils, I'm more able to see what's around me to save me from the Rottweiler. All right. The next one are glands that are um, part of primarily part of the digestive system, but lacrimal, that's going to be in your eye, nasal, that's in your nose, and then pancreas, salivary, and gastric are all part of digestion. Do we need these things to run away from the Rottweiler? Absolutely not. In fact, in, a, in some of these cases with um, lacrimal and nasal and salivary, those are wastes of water. And, and when we're in, um, let's say that we're bleeding or we have low blood pressure because we had diarrhea or vomiting or something, our sympathetic's gonna kick in because I have lost some volume of blood and fluid in my body. And so I've got to push that blood and, and fluid, I have to get that to my brain and my vital organs. And so my sympathetic nervous system will do that. So it's gonna inhibit any waste of water and it's also going to inhibit the digestive process because like he said, um, I'm waiting for a sneeze. Um, Oh, excuse me. Your burrito can wait while you're trying to save your life. Okay, so digestion of your burrito can, can be postponed. So sympathetic nervous system is going to inhibit your secretory activity. Now, sweat glands. Okay, this is an, this is an exception um, to, to water loss. I mean, you, it ultimately will be, though they will be inhibited. But in the beginning, think about, I'm running away from the Rottweiler. I'm using my muscles a lot. Same thing's gonna happen in strenuous exercise. What do you do? You start to sweat because muscle contraction produces a lot of heat and you need to cool yourself down to stay in homeostasis. So what do you wanna do with your sweat glands? You wanna sweat. And so your ability to sweat is um, stimulated or is controlled actually by uh, sympathetic stimulation. Okay, when we go to the adrenal medulla, that's where we get the epinephrine from. So obviously to run away from the Rottweiler and need that extra boost of epinephrine. And remember we said last time that why your heart still pounds after you've you know, saved yourself from a stressful situation is that the epinephrine is still coursing through your body and it has to be removed by your kidneys and your liver before those feelings will go away. All right, also under temperature regulation is sympathetic stimulation. So uh, if you recall, attached to all of your hair follicles are erector pili muscle, and the job of those uh, muscles is to stand your hair on end so that you can trap air against your body and get warm. And so um, goosebumps are part of sympathetic stimulation to help warm you up. But think about this. Um, your hairs can be receptors for things, especially if you have whiskers. Now we don't have whiskers, but um, by making the whiskers stiff in an animal with whiskers like a cat, um, this way they're more aware of what's around them. 
if they're stimulated. And um, it's that, you know, that feeling you get on the back of your neck. Oh, we, we have that saying, your hair makes your hair stand on end. Okay, this, that's why. It's because sympathetic stimulation triggers erector pili. And your sympathetic stimulation was, was kick, kicked in or stimulated by that stressful situation, something that made you scared, something that made you nervous. Okay, running away from the Rottweiler to our heart muscle, absolutely. Increase the rate and force with which our heart beats. Now, what about the blood vessels that go to the heart? We want them to dilate. We want to take lots of blood and nutrients and oxygen to our blood cell or to our heart muscle cells so that they will be able to um, beat faster and harder to move that blood around to, to get us to run away from the, down to our muscles to get us to run away from the Rottweiler. Okay, bladder and urethra. So um, when we are scared, our bladder wall is gonna relax, so, so it's not gonna force urine out. We're gonna contract the sphincters, that's what keeps the urine you know, in the urethra, and inhibits voiding. So you may think, but sometimes you, know, you get the crap scared out of you, or, or you, know, you just, oh, I, you scared me and I just wet my pants or whatever. You're not flooding your bladder, you're not totally releasing all the contents, you're just contracting that sphincter and that will squirt just a little bit of stuff out into you and so it's not all that's inside of your bladder. And then you'll find out that if you've been nervous, you feel like you have to go to the bathroom, but then you go to the bathroom and nothing happens because those sphincter muscles are still contracted. So we don't wanna be wasting time and energy and blood and everything going to the bladder to make us go to the bathroom when we're running away from the Rottweiler. Okay, so there's all of that. Here's just in our in a chart. Okay, then we want um, the lungs. What are they going to do? They're going to dilate. So the smooth muscle that's around the bronchial tube, so little tiny tubes called bronchioles. We want more airflow, and so we're going to dilate those bronchioles so that, or the smooth muscle around them, so that more air can move in and out of your lungs. Digestive tract organs, I think we're to the point where we can, we pretty much understand, yep, we're just going to stop everything. We're not going to carry out peristalsis. We're going to inhibit or decrease the activity of the muscles, the smooth muscles surrounding our digestive system, and we're going to contract the sphincters. So we're going to stop things from moving from place to place. We don't want any digestion to happen, so let's just shut it down. Our liver um, is going to be stimulated to release glucose into the blood so that we have lots of energy. Um, gallbladder, we're going to relax it so it's just a pouch of bile that we don't need to be dumping into our digestive system. In our kidneys, we're going to cause vasoconstriction, so we're going to stop the amount of blood that's going to the kidneys and we're going to move it to other places. And when that happens, that will decrease our urine output so we won't waste water as urine. Um, in reproduction, Specifically with the penis, this is going to cause ejaculation, so the actual release of semen and sperm from the man's body. In the female reproductive system, the vagina and the clitoris, they'll be contracted to, the, to move the sperm up into the woman's body and then increase the mucus. And then blood vessels. So here is super important because there's two different effects. Like he said, if you have... Um, um, uh, alpha receptors, then you're going to vasoconstrict. Okay, so that's the alpha receptors. Alpha receptors. Okay, and then if you are vasodilating, like in the muscles, in your skeletal muscles, then those are going to be beta receptors. Whoops. So alpha receptors cause vasoconstriction, beta receptors cause vasodilation. All right, so there is that. So let's take a look at what parasympathetic, how that's going to counteract the effects of the sympathetic stimulation. To fly a rocket ship, you need to be an optimist. No ass watching me. The heart beats at around 60 beats per minute, once a second, nice and easy. But if you were to somehow disconnect your heart from your autonomic nervous system, things, as you might imagine, would change. But your heart would not stop actually 
it would be the opposite. It would speed up. It would start beating at around 100 beats per minute, and that's just at rest. With your heart beating two-thirds faster than normal before you even broke a sweat, your cardiac muscle would experience a lot of extra wear and tear, the surrounding blood vessels would be under enormous pressure, and your body would suddenly require and waste a lot of energy. Basically, you'd be out of balance. Part of what keeps your heart under control is your parasympathetic nervous system. It's often described as the calming side of your autonomic system, a kind of antidote to the effects of stress created by the sympathetic system. But it's really much more than that. Unlike your sympathetic division, which lets you deal with the crisis of the now, the parasympathetic system allows your body to handle you know, everything else. It not only calms you down after being stressed out, it's what allows you to digest food, to reproduce, to excrete waste, to fight off infections. Basically, it lets you do the business of living. But our bodies can only do that when they are in balance somewhere between excitement and inhibition, both aroused enough and calm enough to keep things working. So the parasympathetic system is why our hearts don't pump so hard that they explode, sure, but it also explains a lot of other stuff about our bodies. Uh, but just one thing, learning about the parasympathetic system is going to involve a lot of memorizing. Hope that doesn't stress you out. <laughs>
Then there's the auditory nerve. You can probably guess what that's for. You might notice that up until the auditory nerve, the cranial nerves mostly control organs in the front of the cranium, mainly the eyes and facial muscles. But as you work your way down, the nerves tend to innervate the lower and more posterior portions of the head, like the glossopharyngeal nerve, which leads to your tongue and your pharynx. That's followed by your vagus nerve. You should definitely remember that one. And then the spinal accessory nerve, which has to do with moving your head and shoulders and not whether your belt matches your shoes. Lastly, there's the hypoglossal, the nerve that allows you to swallow and talk, among other things that could do with your mouth and tongue. That was a lot of information and probably new words, so how are you gonna remember it all? Well, by finding a way to remember the first letter of each name in order, which is O-O-O-T-T-A-F-A, G-B-S-H. That doesn't spell anything useful at all. There is a mnemonic that you probably hear in school that goes like this. On old Olympus towering top, a Finn and German viewed some hops. That's pretty weird sounding. Not terribly easy to remember. I mean, Olympus? Finn? Hops? It's gotta be something more relevant to us 21st century science lovers, like the Lord of the Rings fans out there might prefer something along the lines of Onward, old dorks, toward the Argonaut for a great villain. Slay hobbits. I'm just trying to help. Whatever device you use to remember the names of the cranial nerves, you also have to keep track of their functions. That is, whether they're sensory, motor, or both. So again, from top to bottom, a lot of teachers use this sequence of S's, M's, and B's to remember. Some say merry money, but my brother says big brains matter more. That was not so bad, but I don't know, maybe you'll have better luck with something like this. Sorry, Sherlock, me and Moriarty beat me, but some Bobby's busted Moriarty masterfully. You are, of course, invited to pick up your own, and feel free to share them in the comments. I Hopefully, there'll be some good ones down there. Anything would be better than fins and hops. But if you're going to commit one cranial nerve type to memory, it should be 10, the vagus nerve. This long and extensive nerve stretches from near the brainstem down to most of your visceral organs, including your heart, lungs, and stomach. The vagus nerves work as a two-way street, varying incoming sensory information from the peripheral system to the brain and transmitting outgoing motor instructions from the brain to the rest of the body. So it's a B nerve because it has both sensory and and motor functions, and usually you don't notice this nerve at work because its functions are mostly automatic. Say you've had a really stressful day, so your sympathetic system is charged up, you come home, crash on the couch, mow down a half a pizza. Your stomach sends signals to your brain through the sensory nerve axons in your vagus nerve, telling you that your belly is full of starch and protein and fat. Your brain sees that your stomach is churning away, which is a usual parasympathetic activity, so it sends signals back down through the vagus nerve, triggering other parasympathetic responses like slowing down your heart rate, putting some glucose back into storage, and reducing all that norepinephrine that your sympathetic system was pumping out all day. Soon, you start feeling more relaxed, which is just one reason why for some people, eating is a way of reducing stress and anxiety. In fact, it can feel so good that even though your stomach is full, you might continue eating. So, like I mentioned before, it can be easy to think of the two divisions of your autonomic system as opposites or even rivals, but that's a little off the mark. Looking at your body as a whole, you should picture them as two sides of a scale. Sometimes it's balanced in the middle and sometimes it leans to the left or right depending on what's happening. That balance is the essence of homeostasis and as you'll recall, homeostasis is the key to life. Here's something else that's important for life. Sex. It mostly falls within the parasympathetic domain of necessary, but not an emergency. But in order to effectively do it, you need help from both systems. First, the parasympathetic system has to make sure you're calm enough to even think about sex, and then funnel extra blood away from your muscles and down to your genitals, which is why too much stress and anxiety can lead to sexual dysfunction. But you also need a burst of that sympathetic system to excite you and keep you excited. So like the two sides of the scale, the balance depends on having the right amount of both. The rate of action potential traveling through each division is known as your sympathetic tone and your parasympathetic tone. And most of the time, our parasympathetic tone is actually dominant, keeping down the caged animal that is your sympathetic response. That's why you need your parasympathetic system to keep your heart from racing like a rabbit's, and why most of the time our bodies can do the eating and sex having and all the other fun tasks that make up the business of living. Today on Crash Course... All right. Okay, so the... Very important thing that we learned there is the fact that under normal circumstances, we're in parasympathetic stimulation. And let me make sure no, I'm still sharing that. Okay, um, so 90% uh, of your day, you're going to be in 
parasympathetic stimulation. So this is going to regulate your normal daily activity. So if we go back to our chart and we take a look at what is the parasympathetic doing. Okay, so we go to the eye again. It's going to stimulate the constrictor muscles to constrict the pupil because, you know, most of our day we're going to be in the light. Um, and so we need to constrict our pupils to regulate the amount of light that's coming into our eyes. Okay, we also need to digest the food that we just ate. And so it's going to stimulate the secretory activity of these glands associated with the digestive tract. Now, here is the interesting thing. We already said that the adrenal medulla is not innervated by this parasympathetic. We just don't stimulate it with the sympathetic to make it stop. Well, we also do that with a few other things as well. So one of the things of sweat glands, they just don't do their job when we are not telling them to do their job. So we don't have to innervate them and say, stop sweating. We just don't tell them to sweat and then they stop. So there's no parasympathetic innervation to the sweat glands, to the adrenal medulla, to the rectal pili muscle. We just don't contract them. But on our heart muscle, remember Hank said that our heart likes to gallop along at about 100 beats per minute when we want to keep it down around 60 or 70 beats per minute. And so, um, the, so the heart is always being slowed down by the vagus nerve, by the parasympathetic, to decrease um, the heart rate and to slow and steady the heart. Okay, we're also going to constrict the blood vessels in the heart so that we don't have as much blood flowing to the heart muscle. Uh, we're going to have to go to the bathroom during the day. So our ability to urinate is going to involve those sacral nerves that are down there at the bottom, not the vagus nerve, but the sacral nerves that are down at the bottom um, of your spinal cord in the sacral region of the cranial sacro parasympathetic. Um, our lungs, we're going to constrict the bronchioles. So we're not going to have as much airflow through them, but we don't need as much airflow through them because we're not using them to run away from the Rottweiler or get our oxygen back when we're exercising and get rid of CO2 and other things like that when we're in sympathetic stimulation. Um, our liver, um, all the vagus nerve is going to do is tell it to store glucose because sympathetic is gonna release the glucose. And so we've got to make sure that we store the glucose. And we also may have to make bile, because bile is involved in digestion that's going to be stored within the gallbladder. And so when we're digesting our food, then um, the vagus nerve is going to tell our gallbladder to contract to expel the bile. Um, no innervation to the kidney, and so we just don't vasoconstrict it. The kidney is pretty good at taking care of itself, and so we don't have to have the parasympathetic control it. Um, in the penis, it will stimulate erection. In the vagina and clitoris, it'll cause vasodilation, which is what it's doing in the penis as well. And then in our blood vessels, again, no effect. So there's no innervation, oops, no innervation, just like up in here, we just don't tell our blood vessels to, constr to constrict, and we don't tell our vascular smooth muscle to contract, and therefore vessels will return to normal diameter following synthetic stimulation. Okay, so here's, we can look at that. Um, here are just some extra little things if you wanna look at that, I don't care. All right, and um, so that's where we're gonna stop for today. Um, we will wrap up this on Monday and then Wednesday and Friday we'll do census and then we will take our exam on um, Monday the 4th. So that's when the next test on chapter six, so it'll be autonomic nervous system and senses. Uh, because we don't have a test, oh, I can get out of this. I can look at you guys while I tell you this. Since we don't have a class on Tuesday, I am gonna hold class at one o'clock um, uh, and uh, go over probably senses stuff because I, I do have a lot of stuff to cover there. Um, so we'll have class Monday, Wednesday, Friday at, at 11, and then we'll have class at one on Tuesday as well, but I'll record it in case that you don't want to come or whatever. You just want to watch it at your leisure. Um, so again, nothing on Friday as far as, I mean, Thursday, sorry, as far as classes are concerned next week. Um, okay, so uh, good luck on your, on your test this weekend. Remember that your lab practical is due by 11.59 on Tuesday, and, um, and so I hope that you have a good weekend preparing for all the things that you need to do school-wise and maybe take some time for yourself and enjoy the great weather unless you're somewhere where the weather isn't great and um and we'll see you on monday